and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be a tons of fire that separated and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more towards the end of what I have to share with you today. I want to share with you that everything in the Bible is relevant to what's happening today. So from Genesis to Revelation, it all kind of goes together, meshes together. Um, God's plan for salvation we see in, pa in Passover, right? We see the Passover lamb being sacrificed and the blood uh, taken and putting on the doorpost of the children of Israel, showing the covering of God's, of Jesus' blood over us as we asked him for forgiveness, as God delivered them from uh, Egypt's uh, authority and power, then they took them into the desert and they went up and they wound up in Mount Sinai. So that represents our salvation. Well, I think Pentecost has uh, uh, a significant um, uh, examples in the Old Testament and then they were fulfilled in the New Testament. Amen? So the lamb, the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament was Jesus. Jesus came and actually died and was sacrificed. His blood was shed for us. It was, it was spread on the altar of heaven, if you will, and now we're redeemed from our past and our sins, and our forgiveness is for us, and we have a hope of salvation that we can see him again. Amen? Amen. So Pentecost had to have something to go with the seven feasts of Israel. Anybody know about the feasts of Israel, right? We know that there's seven of them that we kind of celebrate. We have Passover. We have unleavened bread. We have first fruits. We have the feast of Pentecost, the trumpets, and tabernacle. And we know right now that uh, Jesus filled the first three, and we're looking for uh, Pentecost was also filled on, uh, when, as we read it in the book of Acts, and in the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles we're kind of looking forward to. If you could do study at all, uh, the Feast of Trumpets would be the trumpet in Revelation, right? And the, the, the trumpet will blast in 1 Thessalonians, as the dead in Christ will rise first, and those that are alive will rise with them, amen? trouble. And then tabernacles is when God will dwell on the earth again. And the earth will be made new. So he can dwell with us. Amen. He always wanted that. Just like it would go back to the beginning like the Garden of Eden. We'll all walk with God and be with him. Amen. It's going to be a, uh, a wonderful time. The earth will be new. We don't have to worry about uh, all the environmental stuff. Everything will be new and right the way God wanted it to be. Alright. I don't know if there will be pollution or not. But anyway, uh, it's going to be right. It's going to be the way God intended it to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, but we're, let's talk about the, pe the uh, feast of Shabbat. Is the Jewish term for that Pentecost? And during the feast of Pentecost, the Jewish people what they do is they would study the Torah, and it would be part of the family tradition. They'd break out the, the Torah and they begin to read it. Children were encouraged to be in the room and study Scripture too, and they would give them gifts and candy and things to help them along studying more guys just like we do today in our children's program right and also one of the things that they do they would read is the book of Ruth and I'll explain that for a little bit uh, and a little bit later but they would read the book of Ruth because the book of Ruth actually shows the plan of salvation if you read it uh, um, in a way that doesn't even mention Jesus but you can see it as Naomi and Ruth uh, work it out together uh, allowing her to come and be part of her people and uh, self, and, and she became part of uh, their people and she accepted that. Also, um, so we look at the Pentecost as the word of God was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and then was given to the people. The, the word of God was given to them and, and, we, and we know the Ten Commandments were given and he, he, uh, there was a, a significant happening there. I'll explain it just a little bit. Uh, where the people said to God that they would do exactly what he said. They, they made a vow. I will do what you said I should do. And we'll see how that matches up a little bit, how it matches up to marriage. They are married. They're his chosen people. Marriage throughout the whole Bible was, was given uh, as an example of God's love for us and our love for God. Uh, we're called the bride of Christ, are we not? And so in that, we'll see in just a moment how that all fits together, how God, uh, through um, uh, their acceptance of God being their God, and that his law, our old covenant, is now part of what they're going to obey, they said to God that basically what they said is, I do. I will do what you said I'll do. Amen. When I said to my wife, I do, I said, I'll do exactly what she tells me to do, right? 
Isn't that what it was? Not the, okay, well anyway. Uh, it was the ID that you said to me. Okay, that you'll do exactly what I, uh, you, you would do for me. Uh, praise the Lord, we'll have uh, any more arguments today, right? Uh, also, we'll see that the fruit, uh, the first fruits uh, after Jesus was raised from the dead, that was first fruits. It was an example of the spring harvest, and the Pentecost was a time of celebration. The children of Israel would not only bring their offerings to the Lord, they'd bring, uh, they'd bring uh, um, their, their first fruits, one of them was, uh, they bring like wheat, uh, wheat harvest was ready in the spring, the barley harvest, the grapes were ready, uh, the figs, and the pomegranates, I love, how many love pomegranates? The Bible, is a, there is a pomegranate even made out of gold in the temple, so it's really cool. But anyway, uh, uh, and olives and dates were given, and so the first fruits, as we were, in Malachi, we, we talk about the first fruits that we bring to the storehouse. This is the example. It's where they get it from. They're going to bring their first fruits to the storehouse so we have plenty to eat, right? And so today we don't bring uh, wheat and barley and figs and dates to the to the church. I mean, it would be kind of cool if you did. I guess I'd have to distribute them out to the poor in, in the city. But that's what they did. They brought their, their first fruits so everyone would have plenty to eat. And so now we use our credit cards, debit cards, and cash, and checks, right? So, um, and that's okay. Uh, but we bring the first part. And so we see that the first part was anointed, was blessed, when we talk about the first fruits of God. We see how God uses that um, and multiplies that in your life. I know how many uh, were raised, say, every time you go to church, it was like, well, this is why I was a Catholic church. So every time, you know, the pastor would say it's time for the offering, they'd bring a big basket by. And then, you know, if you didn't give in the offering, now this is the church I went to, so I don't know about your church, but they had this long sticks, the Catholic church, that was pews, so they want everybody to get up, so they had these long sticks, right? And then they'd go down, and everybody would throw their money in, right? And then if you didn't put any money in, they kind of like held it there for a second, you know, like you were like, hey, come on. <laughs> and I was like, hey, you know, sorry, I don't have two cents, my grandma gave knows it, but anyway, it was kind of, kind of what I was saying, we don't, we don't we do that now freely because we know our first fruits are blessed and anointed amen i don't know about you but tina and i still practice where we get our we get our we get paid once a month or most times the first of the month and so the first check we write we still write checks the only check we write is to the church but anyway the first check we write is and before i even go online and pay my bills right i'll go i'll be uh, getting ready to do that even i get ready to send i say tina did you write the check yeah because she has a checkbook in her purse and she'll say uh, no, not yet. So she'll write the check before I hit the send button. What does that mean? Because I'm just honoring God in that little action that my first is His. Amen? Does anybody do that or is it just me? If some of us do that. Yeah, I'm just trying to encourage you because Pentecost was celebrating the, the first, the uh, spring feast, and they brought, that was part of celebration because the Jewish people were required to go not only for Passover to, to Jerusalem to, to worship God, but also on this time, Shavuot. Um, um, say again? Shavuot. Shavuot. Did I say it right? Okay, Shavuot. So they came, and they were required to be there, and they were required to bring their first fruits. And then they had a big celebration. That's why when you read later on in Acts chapter 2, there were a lot of people there hearing their own language, their celebration. Why were all those people in Jerusalem during that time? Because it was already 50 days after Passover, correct? So, um, the Jew, I'm going to read this. Jews from around the world were there to affirm their commitment to the Word of God, to God. That's why they're there. When the Word of God was given at Mount Sinai to the children of Israel, and they agreed to say, I do, they, they were there in Jerusalem on this day to reconfirm to God that they were going to do what He says. So that's what Pentecost was about to them, plus the first to reconfirming to them, to God, that he, they would serve Him with all their heart and all their all their soul. They were, they were acknowledging the old covenant, the law. They're saying, "Yes, I'm going to obey the law." Now, you know, the Jewish people had tons of fence law that they added to it, but for the most part, you put God first. Remember, Jesus said it: "Put God first, serve Him with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength." You know, you have to love Him. And then he says this other part that Jesus said that we all work on every day, right? Is to love others as yourself. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to commit myself again this year that I'm going to love God and I'm going to love people. Other than Pentecost, right? Now, it, it were, they were confirming of, um, they're going to obey the, co the covenant. But this was a, 
th this new Pentecost was not only, um, they were looking at the, the law of obeying the law, but Pentecost now is not so much looking at doing the law, but that they are, there was a spiritual change within us and we say yes to God. Because he said, write these words on the tablet of your heart. It's a spiritual transformation that happened to us when we say yes to Jesus, right? We're born not of flesh, but we're born of the Spirit. We're not under the old covenant anymore. We're not obeying all the laws because it's almost impossible, as you know, to try to do that. That's why they made other laws to try to help you obey the laws. And now we've got laws after laws after laws which is impossible to do. But Doug said, no, no. Under the new covenant, under the new blood, under the new thing, we're just going to obey God because we love Him. And we're going to do right because the Spirit of God has given to us to do the right thing in our lives on a daily basis, right? How many of you, I mean, just example now, we believe the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. He fell on them and began to speak in tongues. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we see that all these people, were, uh, all these Jewish people got saved that day because they recognized that they needed, they needed a relationship with God. They, need, they knew that they were. They need to accept this person that they crucified as the Messiah, the Son of God. And they, 3,000 said, yes, I believe he was the Son of God that day and received salvation. So for us today, we're saying that we're not going to obey all the rules because how many know that even church can be a bunch of rules? Uh, we put it on ourselves sometimes. We just put things on it like we have to be a certain way. Like in our church, we say we want everybody to read through the Bible in a year. So we have a little Bible reading chart. I got mine right here. It's blue. Uh, Raj, you've got it off the internet. We print it out. We put our name on the front. We say, everybody, just please do this, right? But that can become just a, a rule, too, doesn't it? Like, okay, well, how far? I have not said to anybody yet this year, how far are you on your reading? I have said well, how far I was, but I haven't required, because then it also becomes a competition, it becomes a check mark on a piece of paper, it's not really loving on God, because that's what the difference, what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, we're not by following by rules, we're not following out of relationship, we're following out of love, I want to know him, I want to understand him, I want to, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, songs, I want to hear his, I want to hear his breath. When I go in prayer time, I don't just go because out of obligation. I mean, I really want to meet with Father God, and I want to feel His presence. I want my body to go all crazy and tingly because that's what happens sometimes. I love that. I, you know, I just love walking in that. And when the Holy Spirit is talking to me, I want to—I hear Him. I want to be able. To, I want you to do that. I want to just fall in love with God. And then, if I fall in love with God, then I then I'll automatically love other people. Amen. It's kind of it's kind of like God will dump His love into me or pour into me His love and His presence, and His grace, and I will be able to pour that out to people now, and I can look at people differently instead of uh, like most of us do, judge people. And I'll say that for you, but we just automatically judge people, and it's not what God intended us to do. We're not to judge people. We're supposed to love them. Number one people, reason why people don't go to church is because they feel judged. Unbelievers, when they were surveyed, they just said, hey, the reason I don't go to church is because I, I automatically feel judged. So the, the four or five people I talked to this week, I said, in our church, we have a guilt-free zone. I, I say that a lot because it's just something different. But I say it because people feel guilty when they walk into church, especially if they haven't been in church. Right? Or they want to go to church, but they don't come because it's unfriendly. Can you imagine that? Church, God's people unfriendly. The reason the church is unfriendly is because we don't have a relationship with the Father God. Because Father loves everybody. Right? He loves everybody. I don't care what sin that they're in or what lifestyle they're living. It doesn't order from. It doesn't matter because God loves them. Amen? So the new covenant, the new, the new covenant is about <coughs> over. You have to do, Joe, you have to cut your hair a certain way. You have to wear a certain type of shirt. My, grand, my uh, uncles, they kicked out. Remember in the 60s when the hippies kind of started coming to church, right? My uncle was a... a worked on the lake. He was a lake patrol guy in uh, Muskego, Wisconsin. And he, he was bragging to me one day. I was on the boat with him. He was bragging how they kicked people out of church because they weren't dressed right. And that stuck with me. I wasn't even a believer then. You know, I just kind of went to the Catholic church thing. But even to this day, I think, how could he do that? Because some hippie with long hair, or maybe they had a tie-dye shirt, I don't know what, blue jeans, maybe they wore sandals in church or whatever. But they would, allow, they would not allow them in church. I mean, I, to me, that hurt me. Back then, I was just a little boy, maybe eight or nine years old when he said that, but I still remember that. How can that happen? Because we judge, automatically judge people. 
Because we have a system that is not according to the Word of God. In the Old Testament, you had certain rules, you had to dress a certain way, you had to enter the temple a certain way. And when we go up to see the temple, I think it's good we should all learn that. The priest before they even went into the holy place, because if they did, the Bible says in Deuteronomy that they would surely die. I mean, so you had to make sure everything was right. Today, God's not looking at the outside, He's looking at the inside. That's what the New Covenant is about. Amen? The New Covenant is about that we now, God sees our heart in the way we really are inside. And see, on the outside, we can all look nice and pretty and, and oh, praise the Lord, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I used to be funny. I used to think when I was in the first time I went to Pentecostal church, and the pastor and the deacons would be up front, they'd be praying for people, and they'd fall down on the floor. You ever been, ever been in a service like that? And uh, in California, we had that. We People fall down, and if people would walk up to me in California, and they would just fall down and before they even got to me. Because like, I was like, God, I don't want to, I don't want to touch them. I just want you to do whatever you're going to do in their lives, right? And they fall down, and they thought that was really cool. So the people line up to stand in front of me so they could fall down. And I think that's fine. God, do whatever, do what you're doing in, in their lives. But the problem with that was when they got up, they were like the same person. And I'm thinking, if you're really in the presence of God, if God really knocked you down on the floor, which I, I don't have any problem with that, then you're going to get up a different person, right? You're not going to sin, and you're not going to cuss, and you're not going to act and treat your family, right? You're going to be different. There's something to be different when the Spirit of God touches you. Because when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God was deposited in you. Right? And you, cannot, you, can't, you can't come to Jesus unless the Spirit of God draws you. And He's in you. He's a deposit, he's deposit to you. So... If the Holy Spirit is knocking you down on the floor, then you get up, the Holy Spirit is going to do something in your character, in your mind, in your heart, and make you the person of God that you're supposed to be. Amen? Yes. Oh, don't get me really excited now when I'm preaching the truth. You know it's true. Come on. You know it's true. God wants to change us to His image. And He said in John 16, 17, 18, you can read it, it says, God didn't want to leave His disciples comfortless. He's going to send the paraclete. He's going to send you the Holy Spirit to help you. How many times have I said that here? Right? So you can be a strong witness for Him. So not only now you've got a deposit of the Holy Spirit, we see at Pentecost, you're going to get baptized in this Holy Spirit. Amen? The word baptismal, a baptism there means the same as baptizing in water. You're being, going to be submersed in the Holy Spirit. That means you're going to have more of the Holy Spirit than you had before. Amen? And I like to think of it this way. I'm going to have like, uh, I'm going to be just a little more in tune. Amen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be dialed in a little more to hear the voice of God. I'm gonna know that it's the Holy Spirit speaking to, and it's not me speaking to me, because the Spirit of God is in me now and about me. Amen. And then I know the Holy Spirit directs me. I know the Holy Spirit teaches me. So when I'm reading the Word of God, I don't understand. All of a sudden, I get revelation of what that means, or I can put together the Old and the New Testament principles, how they all flow together, how God at the end wants us to be His children, that we worship Him freely, and we can cry out with the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, not be intimidated by our past. Amen? It's a, it's a wonderful thing that was going to happen to us in the future, but God has given us some direction. And He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then I'm gonna, it's, it's because I'm going to give you power now. And most of us know this, all you scholars out there, the word power here means dynamite, dunamis power. He's going to give you power to be witnesses today for his kingdom and for his glory. Not to be a member of Capital City Church or a member of the body of Christ. That's good, and we need the fellowship, and we need all this stuff. But God gave us the Holy Spirit that we have power to be his witness. Why do we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? For one reason only. The Holy Spirit is already given to you, so you already have Him in you, so when you read the Word of God you don't understand it, He's going to help you understand it. He's going to give you revelation about what that person is in the marketplace, and you say, you walk up and you go, you walk in the grocery store, I love this one, uh, I like going into Sensi Foods because there's a lot of older people that go there, so they go in there and the Holy Spirit says, go pray for that person. You're going like, right now, right in front of the checkout line? Is, can we go back by the bakery or something, by the deli instead? Because that's a little easier because there's not a lot of people there. No, but the Holy Spirit will do that for you. Then we have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's the key. Because we want to grieve the Spirit of God. Amen? So, the Holy Spirit is given to you for power. Everybody say power. Power. To be witnesses for His kingdom. Right? 
So with that power, all of a sudden, this, this, uh, at this moment, we see this in Acts. This was prophesied to happen, and it happened. And here we see now the power, the wind, the Spirit of God comes in like a wind, a, a mighty rushing wind, a, a violent wind in some translations, into this upper room near the temple where the disciples were, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, Magdalene, and a few others, about 120 people were in this room. Maybe it was about this size. They were celebrating just like they would at the Passover. They'd probably have a meal there. But one thing they were doing that I think was significant that part of Pentecost celebration was a joyous time. So it wasn't like we're going to, to a somber event like Passover and sacrifice lambs for our family. This was a time of first fruit. So they were celebrating by bringing all their fruit and all their, their vegetables and things to, to the temple. And it was a time of celebration. So this was a great joy. So they were probably drinking and dancing in the streets. All right? So that's why when the Spirit of God came on them in the morning and they started speaking in other tongues, they were saying, hey, those guys are drunk over there. They're having a party. Let's go check it out. And everybody came over and check it out, right? Because the celebration was still going on from the day before and the week before. It was a week-long celebration. So nobody wanted to miss out on some free wine. Or some new wine. My interpretation of it, okay? Saying this is a celebration. And they heard this, this wind. Maybe they saw it. Because it said, uh, tongues as a fire sat on each one of them. And I know from, t I looked up in, uh, I Googled this so I could get a picture of this so I could throw up on the screen. It's just nothing, I can't, because everything looks just not spiritual. It just looks religious, you know. Uh, those pictures, I just thought, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. It just didn't look right. But I can't imagine if all of us in this room right now were praying and worshiping God and just giving them glory, and all of a sudden the spirit, the wind would come through this. We left the windows open for a purpose today. The wind would come through here, and then tongues like fire would fall on us, because it wasn't like anybody doubted that the spirit of God was for us today in that room. I mean, think about it. Just a few moments earlier, a few days earlier, about ten days earlier, they saw Jesus go ascend into heaven. And they stood there and watched, like, wow, the one that we walk with, we we walked on the water and saved us from the, the winds on the Sea of Galilee. The one that was crucified and raised from the dead. The one who ate fish with us. The one who told Peter to, to go cast your net on the other side of the boat and brought him a large amount of fish, a harvest. Amen. That one now is going up to heaven where he said he would go. Amazing. And he stood there and two angels walked up and said, Hey guys, what are you looking at? You know, you're, you're like looking. It's like, hey, what are you guys looking at? Oh, that's Jesus. He's going to He's listening. That same Jesus you see going to heaven. He's coming back. Now, what he said, right? And they went into Jerusalem. They tarried there. They waited in Jerusalem. It was just about 10, day, 10 days from the day that Jesus left the earth. And they were up in the upper room, worshiping and praising and pray, thanking him. And in that moment of, of celebration, and the Spirit of God came. That's why in the Pentecost church, we just like to have a good time on Pentecost. Amen? And a joyful time. And worship Him and glorify Him. And then the Spirit of God came, and they were due with power, it says, as power came on them. And they began to speak in time. We see all the different languages there. Um, and, and then verse 12 says, Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? So whoever made fun of them, and, uh, and some of them made fun of them, they had, uh, they were saying they had too much strength. Then Peter stood up, verse 14, with the eleven, and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He said, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you what happened. He began to explain to them that same Jesus that you crucified, the same Jesus that you mocked, the same Jesus, Jesus that you handed over to the Roman uh, uh, authorities, is that same Jesus that died for you. And resurrect, and they believed. And it says in, that three thousand gave their lives. It said that um, in the verse thirty-eight, Peter replied, "Repent, we baptize every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will be received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call." So people ask me, "Well, isn't the Holy Spirit? This is some of the." Uh, 
some of the things that people say, isn't the Holy Spirit given in this way just for the beginning of the church age? Did anybody hear that before? So it's not relevant today. Has anybody heard that before? You know, so the Holy Spirit is given here. People spoke in tongues. Uh, they, 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 they get gifts. In 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These gifts were given, as I, I taught on last week, for the, for the edifying of the church and for edifying of yourself. Those were given, but those ended because now we're in, the, let's just get the church age started. You ever hear that before? That's not true. Because we see even now later on in Acts at Cornelius' house, the Spirit of God was poured out and they receive it just like we did in the beginning and they began to speak in tongues. Then they were baptized. Then we see another place in Acts where they were baptized and then they spoke in tongues. It's like God can do it in any order He wants to do it in, right? You can be baptized and then you can speak in tongues and you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then be baptized. All you simply have to do, as far as the Word of God is concerned that I see, is you have to believe in Jesus. Amen. He has to be your Lord and Savior. You have to believe it every day, every moment. You have to believe that He is the Son of God. Amen. And that's the message that we share with people. This is the same Jesus that saved me. Is the same Jesus that can save you from your sin. Amen. One more thing I want to share with you. I have two loaves of bread here. Part of the celebration time is that the priest, the high priest, would take two loaves of bread. And most of you are probably already know what this is for, right? But they do a wave offering during this time, during the celebration. So they take the loaves of bread, and they would it would be uh, bread with, made with yeast, so it would, be le uh, it would be unleavened bread, it would be leavened bread, two loaves they'd have. And the priest would take it, and they would do a wave offering. So they'd go like this, right? And then they would say a prayer, and then they'd go like this, right? And I, was, I had to do this one time when I was reading the words, because it's like, this is what they did, and this is um, how they did it. And so it's like the sign of the cross, right? It's like this, like this. So that's kind of cool, anyway. And then the one loaf of bread, it was two loaves of bread, so I had to research a little bit more and more because it's just like, why, why two loaves? Why not just one loaf? Because we have communion, but why not? Why two? Because one loaf represented what? Anybody? This is a test. One loaf rep represented, not Tina, because she wants one loaf represents one thing, and the other loaf represents something else. The bread is work represents what? In the Bible. Word. The Word, Word of God. Yeah. The Word of God. So one loaf represents what? Word. The, the Torah, the Old Testament, the law. Yeah. And the other loaf of bread represented the, the New Covenant. They did this every year at Pentecost. They had this wave offering. They used two loaves of leavened bread. They didn't, they didn't sacrifice this bread. It was the rules behind it. They wouldn't take it and burn it on the altar as a, as a, a offering up to God. But God just, because it wasn't time, <laughs> it all goes together, because it wasn't time for Jesus to die yet. The new covenant it wasn't happening yet until, until he came, amen? So every year, they would do this for centuries until Jesus came in and died uh, on the cross for us as a way of offering, amen? Anybody get anything out of this today? Amen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because I, I believe God wants to do uh, do for us. Say again. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, you know, when you do some research on this stuff, there's so much that goes together with the Word of God. So the day of Pentecost. Is 50 days, I mean, no, it's 50 days after Passover, right? But when the, in the Jewish celebration for Pentecost, they would do 49 days. They didn't do 50 days. It was 49 day celebration. And so now we do the 50 days because the 50 day now represents the new covenant. Does that get you excited or not? It represents God had always in his plan that we would now, when Jesus said, go into Jerusalem and tarry until you've been a new power, that was the 50th day from Pentecost. That's why we sell the cross on this Sunday. Um, actually, it was the second and third of, of June, so the, the real Pentecost, the Jewish calendar, of course. But we have to wait till Sunday because we celebrate church on Sunday. Sunday, right? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> is that all right? So everything. So let's. Um, um, Book of Ruth is is, is one sixteen. Um, so this is what they would read. This was Naomi and Ruth's discussion. Chapter 1, Book of Ruth. Maybe you haven't read the Book of Ruth in a while. It's only, you know, 
couple chapters, so two pages of my Bible, so not very much. Great salvation story, how Naomi was provided for by our kinsman redeemer. But uh, this verse really uh, should minister to you, I hope. Uh, verse um, 16 says, But Ruth, Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you, this is talking to Naomi, or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. For the Lord, may the Lord deal with me, but be ever so severely, if anything but death separates me from you. Could you imagine saying that as a prayer today? You say it to God, though. Don't say it to me, but say to God, God, you are my God. And where you go, I will go. Amen? And your people will be my people. Amen? And I like the last part. Let not let something severely happen to me if nothing will separate me from God except death. You're making a commitment to God. And God is saying, come. But I'm saying to God, nothing will separate me except for death. My relationship with you is more important than anything in the world. Only death will separate me. I will follow you, God, with all my heart. And see, God knew that we needed help, so that's why he sent us the Holy Spirit. I mean, how do you feel like we're, you, were, you get attacked sometimes on every angle? People make fun of you. People question you, your motives. I mean, it's just we're constantly bombarded in our relationship, in our in our uh, relations with our family even, relations with our co-workers, everywhere, every direction, Satan is coming in like a flood trying to destroy your witness for him. But I'm saying to God, I will not compromise my belief in you. I will not change for the world's sake. I will be a light on a hill shining so people will be drawn to Christ. I heard a sermon this week, and we're going to take communion in just a minute. I have to come up and make a commitment to God. But I heard a sermon this week, and I love this because I, when I was, a, was doing evangelistic work and street ministry and doing in jail ministry and things and going in places that most people, Christians, won't go to, and I was doing that, you know, I didn't go in there with this big, bright light and shining into people's faces like, you're bad, you know? You're this, this, or that, right? I didn't have a big floodlight saying, I just had a candle if you will, held it up so they could see that. And what's that commercial on TV now? You can see a, a what, a hundred? Ten miles. Ten miles of a flicker, a light. Yeah. You're going in the naked, with your naked eye, you can see ten miles away a light. Can you imagine that? It's not a bright light. It's a light that people are being drawn to. Amen? That's what you want. You want to illuminate Christ in your life. You want them to see you the way you act, the way you are. You want that light just to be enough. So people will be drawn to that. The Holy Spirit is that fuel, that light, that uh, power that we need to have that light keep burning in our lives. Amen? Maybe today, let's everybody turn that in Ruth. Are you in Ruth right now? Well, I'm going to close with this. And I'm going to have, we're going to have communion. And I think what we're going to do today, we're just going to have, um, yeah, why don't we just have you guys come up. And I want you to take a piece of bread. Um, and a, and a cup, and we're just going to stand up here together, and I want to pray over you. Uh, uh, we're just going to pray. I want to pray over you before we take communion. Richard's going to come and pray for the uh, the emblems before we partake of them. But I want to take it. But just take a moment right now, and I'm going to read this um, commitment. That's what it was. The Jewish people in the desert was committed to God when they the Torah was given. They said, "Yes, I do. I will serve you." And today we're doing the same thing. We're saying, yes, God, I will serve you. I will serve you with all my might, all my strength, everything with that name. And if there's anything in your life that, you know, maybe is hindering you from getting closer to God, maybe this would be a moment for you to say, hey, God, please help me. Is that okay? Please help me. Take this out of my life. Take this fear out of my life. Take this, this, this hindrance. Take this out of my life. And help me to say this prayer like, Nathan, like Ruth said. It says, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave or to turn back to you or back to their old ways. Where you go, 
I don't want to go back into my old life. I don't want to go back into being a sinner. I don't want to go back to the old stuff that I had before, but I want to have this new life. Naomi, or you can say God, wherever you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people, your people, God, will be my people. And you will be my God. <coughs> where, where you to die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me but ever so severely, if anything but death separates me from you. We say that to God. Lord, let nothing but death. And even in death, we know we have life now because of Jesus. So it's really a joyful thing. Amen. Right? We, death, we, death is not like Naomi saying, I'll die and I'll lose. I'll, nothing but death will separate me from you. But really, I'm saying, nothing but death. I'll, until death, God, I will serve you. Because in death, there is life. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's stand together and take a moment and, and just pray where you're at. Ask the Lord uh, if there's anything in your life that needs to be taken care of. If not, hey, come up here skipping full of joy and, um, and grab some emblems and stand up here. And then we're going to take a few, just a few more moments and pray over them. And we'll take the emblems together. Then we're going to go down and celebrate uh, a birth or life. Yes, a new baby coming very shortly. Praise the Lord. Yeah, go ahead. Praise the Lord. I'll just take a minute. Father, is it anything within me, God? It's not of you, Lord. You just, just take it away. Holy Spirit, reveal to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Please just reveal to me, God, anything that will separate me from you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And just come as you will to come get the emblems. May you originally to serve food.
the time and just give God thanks for what he did. Amen. So I'm going to have Richard uh, pray over the bread that represents the body of Christ that broke for us. And then we're going to partake of that together. And then uh, Angel's going to pray over the, the glass of his grape juice that represents the blood of Jesus. So Richard, would you pray as God's blessing over the bread that represents his body? Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your body that was broken. Thank you, Lord. We take remembrance, Father God, and, and, and understand, Father God, what, what the cost was, Father God. And Lord, as we partake of it, Lord Jesus, we, we're reminded of our commitment, Lord. We're reminded, Father God, that, that by your wounds we're healed. We're reminded, Father God, that uh, you've taken of all our shame and guilt, Father God, and you've made us new in your image, Father. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. In Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. 